Good evening or good morning or good afternoon for whenever you are watching our Sabbath School. It's going to look a little different this week. We had a technical glitch, so all the panelists are being done individually. Uh, we're sorry that it's not a group thing because there's some great discussion we could have afterwards. But Stan, since you are doing Sunday, would you begin with a word of prayer? Dear Father, we're so thankful for the Bible and all it means to us. We're so glad that we can hear your voice speaking to us through the Bible. And we just pray that your voice will continue to pierce the dark souls that we uh, tend to encounter, uh, even sometimes our own. And Bring us out into the light, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Sunday's lesson is um, a very good one. It's called Jesus, the basis of our technology. Um, and uh, this lesson we're going to spend just about all of our time, in um, the first 10 verses of chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And I'd just like to remind you that um, in chapter 1, the book starts with the kind of the standard wording of one of the letters from the Apostle Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and, faith, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. One of the key phrases um, a little bit later in the, in the chapter is that um, the, he talks about the people that are um, sealed to salvation in him, in Christ. And he talks about the Holy Spirit as the guarantee, the promised Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. I kind of like that phrase, to the praise of his glory. So we come to chapter 2, and it's got, chapter 2 has some very um, famous um, phrases and verses in this chapter. And um, there's, we're going to spend a little bit of time with just a few of them. So we're going to start reading, and we're going to read all the way through um, from verse 1 of chapter 2 through verse 10. So get out your Bibles. Let's read together. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages 
he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the first three verses of this chapter describe for us the condition that we were in before Christ. And by the way, this particular chapter, the little phrase, prepositional phrase, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, is a favorite with the Apostle Paul. And you see it repeated numerous times in this chapter. It's famous. This chapter is famous for that. So our condition before Christ is one in which um, our physical birth has taken place. And in regard to our physical birth, as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned, our physical birth is a birth into sin. It's not that a child has sinned as such, but sin is the atmosphere that we are born into on this globe. Nobody can escape it. You can't um, not sin. It's um, the condition, it's the situation. And I might just say that the, you know, the physical condition is that our bodies are made up of all these molecules and, and um, things. And it's like sin is a vital piece or part or however you want to describe it, of every single molecule of your whole body. So there's no way you can get rid of sin on your own. It's like having a coronavirus in every single um, molecule of your body. And there's no way to uh, get rid of it. We're born in it. We're born with it. It's a part of us. And only the Creator can do something about this. So those first three verses describe um, our condition before Christ. And now we come to um, the verses after Christ. So we start with, we take a closer look at uh, verse four. And I was kind of looking, <clears throat> I was kind of looking at, um, the Greek interlinear Bible, to Greek to English, and um, there's a little bit of sequence of words when you read it, uh, read the English, that kind of caught my attention, and I'd like to uh, for you to notice it with me. Now, stay with me. I'm not going to read the Greek, but I'm going to uh, just read it as it is in the English. But God, being in mercy, and the word being is like um, um, he lives in or exists in mercy. God, being in mercy, living in mercy, existing in mercy, rich in mercy, because of his great love, his agape, wherewith he loved us, quickened us with, <laughs> and this is a cool phrase, quickened us, made us alive, infused us, with the Christ. 
And then the parenthetical phrase right there, by grace ye are saved. He quickened us with the Christ and raised us up together and seated us together in this heavenlies, in the heavenlies, in Christ Jesus, that he might show in the ages that are coming the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us. And there, another uh, one of those phrases, in Christ Jesus. Um, I find that um, when you're thinking about Jesus as the basis of a testimony, we have no testimony without him. Without a, an experience with him. Without God infusing him into us. That's the basis of our testimony. What Christ is working within us now um, preparing us for that day when he will return. It's, he's begun now through the Holy Spirit to prepare us and get us ready. And because of that experience and that preparation that he's now doing within us is what gives us the basis of a testimony to share with others. I know that I know that one of these days my neighbor is going to hear this testimony and it'll be interesting to see what happens and what God does. There's a, uh, <clears throat> a phrase near the, right near the end of the lesson that I wanted to share with you. It's from the book, Desire of Ages. And right in the middle of the paragraph, Ellen White says, we are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. So I want that to be part of my testimony. I hope you do too. Thank you, Stan. And I really appreciated hearing the translation, the literal translation from the Greek into English of Christ being in mercy, God being in mercy. Um, it's it's what what he dwells it's who he is and it's yes. what he wants to make us and so thank you very much yeah it just caught my attention and just it kind of alters your thinking instead of the flow of the 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 even flow of the english and making it sound all nice but when you go back and kind of just follow the words it gives you kind of a real different um impression and truth about God. I like that. It's almost as if he couldn't help but give us mercy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a part of him. It's who he is. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. So, John, why don't you share with us what you would like to share from Monday's lesson? Sure. Well, Monday lesson title is Transformative Power of Personal Testimony. And um, it was very interesting to see again how much more powerful it is changed lives to convey the, the, the power of God to save people. And no offense, Pastor, I mean, I love theology, I love discussing, that's what we do here. But I realize again that uh, our Bible study is more like an act of worship than, you know, than being studying as a test to witness to people. 
And again, as we were reviewing the story of John and James, I mean, I think, I mean, John wrote the Gospels and, and first and second, third John and Revelation for powerful theology. But, but, but sometimes it's more powerful to see two brothers who had been called sons of thunder, right? And I'll explain in a bit, we're going to review a few texts, the reasons for that. And then these two became disciples of love, right? I mean, mo mostly John, but I would imagine that James got a little bit of the love as well. <laughs> So, uh, but it's amazing. And again, a changed lives is what matters, right? Because that's the ultimate result. And I think today in the midst of fake news and a lot of sales speech and a lot of people trying to come up with content upon content on the internet, it's not very easy to cut through the color, clutter and then make an impression on people's heart. But when they see somebody with a changed life, that's really what it matters. So I'd like to read with you guys. Uh, let's start with Luke 9. 54 through 56, I'm reading from the New King James Version. And then I'll read it and you follow along. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as, just as Elijah did? So what, what they saw was Samaritan opposition as they were marching towards Jerusalem. Jesus was going to go there for the last time to be crucified, right? All right, as they were going to Samaritan uh, village, right? So they uh, faced opposition and they couldn't uh, spend the night there. So uh, the disciples um, gave Jesus a suggestion to do just like Elijah did and call fire from heaven. And then if we, we're going to go quickly to go what, what Elijah did in 2 Kings 1, 7, 7 through 11 in the New King, King James Version. Uh, Elijah was rebuking some messengers of the king who was the son of Ahab. And the king was ill, and then he, was cons he asked some messengers to consult with another god. And then Elijah went and confronted the messengers and said to the messengers, isn't that because we don't have uh, a god in Israel that you consult other gods? So you're never going to recover. You're going to die pretty much. And then the king sent 50 men and a captain to confront Elijah and bring Elijah to talk to the king. And what Elijah says is this, uh, in verse 9, 2 Kings 1, 9. Then the king sent to Elijah a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So they went up to Elijah, and there Elijah was, sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, Men of God, the king has said, Come down. So Elijah answered and said to the ca captain of 50, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. That was not the first time Elijah uh, commanded fire down from heaven. Do you remember the challenge with all the 400 prophets? Elijah did it again. And on the story, Elijah does it another time. And then another 50 people die. So why I'm saying this story? Because it's easy for us to blame John and James that they were nervous, that they were sons of thunder, that they would have like a bad temper and Jesus changed them. Actually, they were doing something that was the custom of a prophet, right? Jesus was a prophet. Even if we look at, we don't need to go there, but Luke 9, 18 to 20, some people said that Jesus was Elijah. So it was completely normal for them to command Jesus to bring fire down from heaven. And Jesus flipped them on it, their head, right? That's not the way we're going to handle things, right? And I'm going to show you when I go to Jerusalem, ultimately, how I handle sin. So the question to us today is how much Jesus' love can transform our lives and how much can we uh, get rid of our ways of handling sin and evil in the world the way Jesus handled, right? So I know that, I mean, of course, our church needs to have discipline, right, when somebody commits adultery or some sin or whatever, right? And I'm not saying that we should abolish this, Pastor. Don't, don't, don't be scared. But the reality is Jesus calls us to a higher standard of dealing with sin. It's the way of mercy, right? And then we see in a group of 11, right, carrying this gospel forward. We see in the middle of them, we see fishermen, we see sons of thunder, we see zealots, which were pretty much revolutionaries, right? And, then, and they wanted just to bring the kingdom by warfare, and then we see like Matthew, tax collector, publican. So you see like a very strange mix of people that could only be together by the love, grace, and mercy of Jesus, right? So that's why he did not 
came, uh, brought fire down from heaven. That's why we should not do a lot of things that our instincts tell us to do today and treat people differently. That is the power, uh, the transformative power of God's love. I like that, John, and I'm, I'm reminded that, uh, or thinking about the fact that throughout the Gospel of John, there's several places where John refers to the disciple that Jesus loved. And uh, it really, most people think he's referring to himself, and I, I, I think that's probably right. What's interesting is in the original Greek, it's in the present, which means it's really better translated the disciple that Jesus kept on loving. Hmm. So while John's writing the gospel, which is a powerful gospel about who Jesus is, I think throughout his, this, this thing, he's giving his own testimony that he is the disciple that Jesus kept on loving in spite of being a son of thunder, in spite of fighting with the rest of the disciples about who's going to be first and being selfish and wanting glory. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that reminds me of Romans 5, right? When, when uh, Paul says that while we were still sinners, right? Christ died for us. And I think Christ, Jesus died for, for John while he was still the son of thunder, right? He didn't wait until he became the disciple of love, right? He loved him as he was. And that was probably what, what made the, uh, the most important mark on him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. Thank you so much. Mary Jo, what are you going to share with us tonight? Well, Tuesday's lesson is telling the story of Jesus. And what I really liked about this lesson is the simplicity I found in it as I studied. Um, the Bible is full of stories. And our lesson alludes to uh, two in particular uh, by starting out with a question. And the first um, question he asked was, who were the first missionaries Jesus ever sent? So we're going to talk about the story of the demoniacs that you find in um, Matthew 8, 28 through 34, and Mark 1 through 20. And we'll be focusing on Mark 1 through 20. But what we're paraphrasing, um, essentially it's the story of um, demon-possessed man. As Jesus stepped off, he went across uh, the country, stepped off to go into the city, walked in, and they're met by these uh, demon-possessed gentlemen, and they wouldn't let him pass through the tomb, um, through the graveyard that they were guarding, and um, the demons in these men called out to Jesus asking, you know, why are you here? Are you here to torment us? It's before your time. You're not, you know, we still have some time to run around here, um, so don't get rid of us, you know, and um, go ahead and put us in the, the herd of swine that the city, nearby city, uh, the swine herders, I guess, were taking care of. Um, so he did banish the demons out into the um, swine. And, um, and then the swine just ran down the hill and went ahead and drowned themselves. So they couldn't even deal with all this horrible stuff. Um, and then um, the people in the city, the herders went back, told the people in the city, this people came back and they told Jesus, you know, you need to leave. You know, that's enough. So that's essentially the story of Matthew, um, version of this story. And then we go to Mark. Now, Mark's a little more interesting because there's a little more detail. Uh, it talks about one of the demoniacs. It names the demons, as we know, the legion is what the name that came out of there. And when the demons were sent out to the pigs from the man, the man was of right mind, sound mind. He wanted to wear clothes. He wasn't crazy anymore. And he was just in awe by what Jesus did for him. And he wanted to sit at the feet of the master and he wanted to learn all he could. He wanted to be with him. Well, when the city people after, you know, came back to tell him, you know, um, you need to leave Jesus, the demoniac wanted to go with him. And Jesus says, no, I need you to stay. I need you to stay, go back to your city, your city, Decapolis, and you need to tell them of the um, compassion that the Lord had on you today. And so the demoniac did, though he wanted to stay with Jesus, he did what he was told, and he went back to the city, and he told all these people about what Jesus did for him. A man who was beyond wild, who was so broken and couldn't be among other people, and you know couldn't wear his clothes, and just was angry and, and all, 
was totally changed and was full of love and full of um, um, great things to say. So who were the first missionaries? Well, in this case, it was the demoniac. Now, what is the simplicity here is that we have all these stories in the Bible, but just to share the stories of the Bible is a story and people all have stories of their own. And what's important here is the demoniac, when he shared his personal testimony, it was so powerful versus just telling a story that someone might have heard. So as, as the, he stood before the people, how could they argue against what they were seeing? You know, what could, how could they argue against that significant change? So in essence, the changed lives are the most powerful testimony, as um, John had mentioned just prior, that they are the most powerful testimony. Um, because people can argue with your theology, they can argue with what you believe, they can argue about the stories in the Bible, but they can't argue if they knew you before and here you are now. You know, they can't argue your story of where you're going forward. So it is, it is just really important that we tell our own stories. Now, for a lot of people, that story is life-changing. They were a drug addict or they, you know, lost all their money from a gambling issue or they had some horrible thing happen and they were changed, you know, in prison and they came out a changed man or changed woman. Um, it's important on those though there are also stories where the change is subtle the change is gradual it is a growing and um, just a change of heart as you go and the closer you get to God you're infused with his grace and the more you go look for him and try to find the Holy Spirit and do all that good stuff you are imbued with this light and this love of, of Jesus that comes out um, so telling the story your own story of Jesus is a more effective way to witness no matter where you are. And it's whoever your sphere of influence is. And your story can be told to your children, to your grandchildren, to your neighbors, or it can be huge where you're doing the circuit and sharing this revelatory kind of testimony. But the point is, is that it is your story and your story of what Jesus has done for you. So my question for you is, what is your story of Jesus? And I think that's a very important question to ask people, Mary Jo, mm -hmm. and for people to think through. And most of the time when you ask people <clears throat> about their story about Jesus, there's often a blank stare. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a very healthy and, and good way for us to be prepared to give our story. And, and I learned this a long time ago. And that's that you sit down and you write a timeline, if you will, of your life and where have you seen God at work in your life mm -hmm. and when you do that you need to ask God God where have you been at work in my life because when you do some things might come to your mind that wouldn't come otherwise and it's interesting when you do that and even if you've done it before you can do it again some new things might come forward I've done it two or three times mm -hmm. and I'm going oh there was that time and oftentimes when I'm doing that because of where I'm at currently, what I remember, how God worked in the past, has a connection to what I need today. And so just putting down a timeline of, I was born in, into a Christian family, or I was born without any faith in the family, whatever it might be, and to, to be able to say, this is how God, these are the people God used, this is the event that took place, this is the moment when I fully surrendered, this was the moment when I heard a sermon that, that really spoke, whatever it might be, by doing that, that enables you to tell your story more freely. I just love that idea because I wouldn't have thought about a visual, if you will. But I, I have one story that's kind of this way that I traveled Europe, did the Eurail thing, and I was visiting a friend. We stopped at a friend's house in Germany, and it was on a Sunday, and of course, they, the little village they lived in shut down on Sunday, and you go to church. Well, it happened to be a very special service, and it was one of those churches where you walk in, and the pulpit is like on a spiral going up, and he, they kind of talk down at you and whatnot. And it was all in German. 
But you know, what was being said, uh, said transcended my heart somehow, even though I, when they, they kind of told me what went on after, of course, but it was like, wow, that was a moment the Holy Spirit was talking to me in a way to have me ask questions again. So it's like one of those things that, you know, all along, I've had, I've had this little nudging going on through my whole life, you know, because I have one of those stories that is just very uh, slow and gradual. It wasn't life changing or an event that caused me to want to become a Christian. But as I look back or think about things, there are these moments like that going through my life. So you're right. It's like, wow, you know, who would have thought at that time? So anyway. Thank you so much. Well, Charles, you, you get a double blessing. You get to share two le days lessons with us. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, well, Wednesday's lesson is uh, testifying with assurance. And in this lesson, um, I'm going to read Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22. And it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Uh, so the studies, the lesson starts, the Wednesday's lesson starts, it says, begins if we do not have a personal assurance of salvation in Jesus, it is not possible to share it with someone else. Uh, we cannot share what we do not have ourselves. And from this um, perspective, what is trying to say is that when we are not certain and assured that Jesus has really freed us from our sins, um, it is, becomes difficult to really share a personal testimony. Um, and it's because sometimes it becomes more about what we have done instead of what God has done. And it becomes more about um, self-centered instead of, you know, looking at the cross and looking what um, God has done for you throughout your life. But the thing I wanted to really emphasize is that do we truly know if God has really saved us? Do we know if God is truly um, in our lives? And I just want to just, just um, think about this because Jesus has really um, been in my life in ways that I don't, I've never really always seen. But there's just been little moments that uh, God has shown himself to me. And uh, one of the things is that before I used to believe that my works was the means to salvation and i felt like everything i was doing needed to be perfect because if not then you know i wasn't going to be not only have salvation or righteousness but also i wouldn't have favor in god's eyes and i was actually looking toward um, the church or people's opinions for you know assurance and i was looking at toward the all the other all other things in christ and so when i learned about you know, the blessed assurance. Um, it was when I was going to um, a school in Oregon and it, a teacher was telling me that um, when the, he was, he was telling me a story and the story goes that when they were built, when people were building the Golden State Bridge, uh, a lot of them were falling to the death and the mayor was like, this is unfortunate. This is not a good thing. Like we need to stop this. So they built a big net under the Golden State Bridge and uh, so people, when they did fall, you know, they would be caught. And um, they saw that not only people were being saved when, when they did fall, but they also saw that there was actually less falls because the people knew that they were going to be, you know, caught if they did fall. And this simile, uh, this uh, metaphor goes to what Christ do does in our lives. You know, when we know that Christ does save us from our sins, when we know that, you know, Christ has come down to earth to free us from our sins then we stop looking at all our faults and the, and the times we fall and we start looking at the net or you know jesus we start looking at what he has done for us and it's not about um as i said what we've done but it's about 
really accepting by faith what Christ has done. And not only just in the mind, but also in the heart through his Holy Spirit. And no understanding that we're not saved by works, but we're saved by grace of God and, and salvation in Christ. Um, however, we do have the free choice to walk away from him. We still do have the free choice to leave him and to feel like that net is just there all the time and do whatever we, and fall all the time. And the thing about that is that with that idea that Christ saves me all the time, uh, we keep on doing a reoccurring sinful, it becomes a sin problem. And that's what our world has, a sin problem. So if we believe that we can keep sinning, then we're still hurting the people around us. So there was no point of really um, Christ freeing us from our sins if we're just going to keep on, you know, um, harming the world, harming others around us and doing, you know, evil around us because the blessed assurance wasn't there for us to just keep on hurting people, but it was actually to leave, um, to actually leave a, uh, a, again, a personal testimony, but also uh, leave people with the essence of Jesus and Jesus is love. And so with the understanding of Christ's love, we are loved. So we are able to love others and God more fully. And without, you know, questioning, like, is this enough or is this not enough? Because we know that if we abide in Christ and with, and we, if we're walking with the spirit, we know that daily that we could, you know, be more like him every day. And also this goes with uh, Thursday's lesson. Um, so I'll read uh, Galatians 2.20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, so when we do accept Christ in our life, when we do have that blessed assurance it's going to be hard to surrender some things in our lives. And there's a song that I like. Uh, it's called In the Light. And it's in one of the um, verses, it says, uh, tell me what's going on with me. Um, I despise my own behavior. This only serves uh, the existence that I need a savior. And so that uh, verse always gets to me because it shows that uh, when we do see Christ and the, and the newness of life, uh, we start going away from the old things of life, you know, our addictions, you know, our, um, the things that we used to love that were part of the world. Uh, like for me, for uh, personally, it was like music, certain music I don't listen to anymore. And I actually can't listen to it anymore. And uh, it actually is, it feels like a lot of noise in my head. And it actually feels like it's distracting me more from God. But every person has a, you know, a thing that they're struggling with or something that, you know, that they know that, you know, this is not really keeping me closer to Christ. And so the lesson says death on the cross is a painful death. And it says when we surrender our lives to the claims of Christ and this old man of sin is crucified, it is painful. So as we become a new Christian and a new person in Christ, um, it's going to be painful. Our relationships are going to break. You know, it's, we're going to um, question our identity we're going to you know there's going to be a lot of questions that we have but the rewards outweigh the the pain and through all the the things that are happening it's emerging a, a, a powerful testimony to tell to, to people and as mary joe was saying it, it could be either instant or uh gradual but Regardless of whether you grew up in a Christian home, whether you grew up in a broken home, whether you had a horrible life or whether you don't have like a hard life at all, there's always a testimony to be told when Jesus is in your life. So there are many stories in Christianity and in the Bible that tell about um, sal sal um, how salvation has come to the do our door and been able to change many lives. We can go to the patriarchs we can go to the prophets we can go to the apostles we can go to so many people's lives and all, all our lives around us but what this really does uh, it shows that christ has come not to just save the righteous but all sinners and that nobody is um nobody is uh um nobody is 
exempt from salvation. And I just want to read First uh, John 1, 12. It says, But many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come to ex come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I may come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So with this note and with this in mind, as I said, regardless of what kind of conversion is happening in your life, Christ is here uh, and has come and he's giving salvation to all who um, draw near to him. And uh, it's just a beautiful blessing that we are able to have this blessed assurance, but also being able to testify to all people of all types of backgrounds and all types of cultures and all types of, of places. And it just becomes a beautiful testimony, not to people, but to ourselves too. So with that ending note, uh, I just hope that you, got, everybody will find a, you know, a, a little personal testimony within yourselves. And if you can't find one, just ask the Holy Spirit and ask God to um, teach you or to you know, identify what you can tell people. Because everybody has a story. I'm, I'm reminded as you read John 1.12, that's really part of an adoption formula. And mm -hmm. as many as received him, he gave the power or the right or authority to become the son or daughter of God. One of the big moments in my life was in 1994 or 95 when it really hit me full bore, not just intellectually, but in the deepest in my heart, that I am a son of God, a son of the king of the universe. And having that assurance, which goes back, Charles, to your uh, illustration about the Golden Gate Bridge, having that assurance changed so much about how I related to God and how I focused on things. Because part of that reason they quit falling off as much was because they weren't so scared of falling off as much. They weren't so afraid of messing up. And I think there's many Christians who are so afraid of messing up they have no joy in abundant life because they're always going about comparing themselves to others or comparing what they've done or how whether or not they've grown rather than knowing that I am a child of God and that his love is constantly there for me. And like you said, that doesn't mean I can do whatever I want to. In fact, it's just the opposite. When you realize that, you want to please him more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys so much, Mary Jo, Charles. John had to leave us. And of course, uh, Stan, we recorded on another night. <clears throat> but I just want to make a bridge to next week's lesson. The title of next week's lesson is A Message Worth Sharing. And while I believe a message is important, if we cannot combine the message with the person, that we're not just sharing an idea or a thought, that whatever our message is has to be connected and have Jesus Christ at its center. So as you study the lesson for next week, please keep in mind, it is not just a message of truth. It is a message about the one who is the truth and the way and the life. And may we each one experience that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for your love for us. We thank you that we can share the testimony, the witness of how you have entered into our lives and changed us and how we have peace in the midst of turmoil, how we can have hope in the midst of despair, how can we, we can have joy even in the midst of sadness. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. May God bless you richly.